the Virginia Horse Industry Board, Southwest Virginia Agricultural Association, and the Virginia Christmas Tree Growers Association are proud sponsors of Virginia Farming. This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Large or small, Virginia farmers work year-round to help put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Polaris, featuring its hardest working, smoothest riding off-road vehicle, the more powerful Sportsman 850HO, and the workhorse Ranger XP. Hunt, farm, or trail, Polaris has a vehicle for them all at polaris.com. Hi everybody, welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. Each year, the United States President pardons a turkey in what has become a fun and quirky tradition since the 1980s. This year's turkey hails from Virginia, and we'll talk to Steve Willardson, President of Cargill Value Added Meats, and Hobie Bowen, President of the Virginia Poultry Federation on Ag Insights. Then we'll learn about drying gourds when we go in the garden, and we'll have the Ag Calendar and a Minute in the Field video. All of this plus the Ag News of the Week on this edition of Virginia Farming. VDAX has announced that Albemarle, Nelson, and Page counties have received USDA designation as primary disaster areas due to excessive rain, hail, high winds, and lightning associated with a derrico that occurred between June 28th and July 3rd of this year. Now, the 14 counties seen here in green received contiguous disaster declarations, meaning they border a county named as a primary disaster area. This designation makes farm operators in both primary and contiguous counties eligible to be considered for assistance from the Federal Farm Service Agency, provided eligibility requirements are met. Now, this assistance includes FSA emergency loans. Farmers in the eligible counties have about eight months to apply for emergency loan assistance. Local FSA offices can provide affected farmers with more information. Now, to find the FSA office nearest you, visit fsa.usda.gov. The Virginia Junior Livestock Expo recently invaded the Rockingham County Fairgrounds. We were there when the animals were arriving and the event was getting underway. The Virginia Junior Livestock Expo is the culminating event for all Virginia 4-H and FFA youth involved in livestock projects. Dr. Paige Pratt talks about this year's location. We are at the Rockingham County Fairgrounds in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and we are at a facility that allows us to house all of the animals on one site and have multiple show rings happening at one time so that we're able to showcase all, multiple shows at one time and get all, everything shown in one weekend. Being held in Rockingham County is different than in years past, but when the state fair filed for bankruptcy early this year, Pratt said it was time to bring their contingency plan to fruition. We then decided to go into full action to ensure that we had a culminating event for these youth because obviously they put in so many hours and so much time and money into these projects. It was important for them to know that we would have a state event for them to showcase their hard work and efforts. Pratt says numbers are up this year. We have 318 exhibitors entered for 4-H and FFA members. And from that, we have 398 beef cattle, 502 sheep, 110 meat goats, and 170 head of swine. Not all competitors come from large farms. Katie Hope is from Dry Creek Farm in Berryville. We run about 20 head of cattle. It's not very big. Uh, it's my farm, its purpose is to pay for my college pretty much. It's, uh, they are my college fund. <laughs> Hope brought five cows to the expo and has shown at a lot of shows this year. At nationals, she brought home some top honors. The heifer right here and her mother, she was a cow calf there and they won their division, which is a very big deal for me. Um, they are both, her mother and her are bred known, so I own their mother and it's, it's unheard of. I, I didn't pay anything for these guys and we went up against a lot of money. A junior in high school, Hope is also a stockman's judge. It's another avenue that's helping with her college fund. 
I've actually already been looking at colleges and them coming to talk to me about judging scholarships and hopefully that will go a long way in helping me get to college. Not only are these 4-H and FFA youth preparing for college, Pratt says showing livestock is a big responsibility, a responsibility that instills good ethics. And youth livestock brings a whole new component of responsibility and understanding and why it's important to have really high quality and integrity in raising these animals so the products they produce from the food um, is then safe and healthy for the consumers. Putting together an event of this magnitude is not without its challenges. The biggest challenge is just ensuring that it is a high quality event for every child and every parent that participates and making certain that the event really um, is the caliber that it should be uh, for the, the hard work that all these youth have put into these projects. And, and so the, the biggest challenge is living up to their expectations of what they think this event should be. And I think this year it, it will be fantastic as it has in the past. What does Hope want out of this expo? If I could win it all, it'd be great. <laughs> well, she may not have won it all, but Katie Hope did place ninth out of 317 in individual stockmans. She brought home one third, three seconds, and a first being named Grand Champion Angus Cowcalf Pair. Many Virginia farmers grow acres of pumpkins each year to sell at their family farm stand. But that's not the only way pumpkins are sold in Virginia. Norm Hyde reports that some farmers are raising thousands of pumpkins and gourds for the wholesale market. It's not the state's top farm commodity, but pumpkins are big business to some Virginia farmers. The Census of Agriculture reports Carroll County ranks 21st in the nation for pumpkin production. Five years ago, Carroll County pumpkin growers were already producing more than half a million dollars worth of pumpkins a year. And the Southwest Virginia Farmers Market makes it possible for local farmers to ship their products all over the East Coast, opening up some real opportunities. We started at a little half acre patch and worked up to a couple acres, four acres, and gradually worked our way up. Uh, we're up to about 92 acres right now, and I'd say that's probably got us maxed out for the most part for what we got to work with. We're, I don't think we can do any more and take as good a care of them as we need to. Travis Marshall raises pumpkins, wheat, and sweet corn on his mountain fields. He's been amazed at how fast the pumpkin business has grown and how fortunate growers in southwest Virginia are to have a good climate for this crop. You take a 30 mile radius around where we're standing, there's uh, 2,500 acres, possibly 3,000 acres growed. It's, it keeps expanding every year. I, uh, I don't know if it's going to continue to do that. Every year you expect a slump in it, and I think we could sell, easily sell twice what we've got planted with no problem. Marshall's pumpkins are sold to major chain stores and to Food City, a local grocery chain that makes a point of buying local food and produce. He rotates his crops each year to prevent diseases and keep weeds down. It ain't too bad the planting and uh, the spraying, but when it's time to get it up, it's <laughs> kind of like no mercy. and. Got to make hay when the sun shines, so we pick pumpkins as hard as we can from pretty much daylight to dark on the pretty days. In addition to decorative pumpkins, Marshall grows thousands of winter squash, including butternut, carnival, and acorn squash. His whole family is involved, and it's a lifestyle he's glad to pass on to his four daughters. I think a lot of it, the work as a family, I think it, it grows good character in the children, and it, it did me, uh, hard work ethics that I received from growing up uh, makes you appreciate things. Marshall says it's not unusual to ship 40 to 50 bins of decorative pumpkins from each of his fields, in addition to the other squash. And he's not alone. Carroll County has as many as 10 pumpkin growers with fields as small as a few acres to up to almost 200 acres. And there are more growers in surrounding counties. It's become a big business, and Marshall says it's a blessing because otherwise he wouldn't be able to make a profit on his farm. And he's good money in it for, for the, you know, you can just use a few acres here and a few acres there. And you, you don't have to have such a large amount of, of money to, to start your business. So really all you got to come up with is uh, some labor and a market. Uh, it, it just fits in real well with most everybody's operation. As long as folks are willing to pay a few extra dollars for a pretty pumpkin each fall, it looks like Virginia pumpkin growers have a thriving market. In Carroll County, Virginia, I'm Norm Hyde. Thank you, Norm. 
Now, VDAX reports that this year's pumpkin crop is very good. Kevin Simones with the Virginia Pumpkin Growers Association said the traditional orange jack-o'-lantern pumpkins are the biggest he's ever seen. Although there were some pockets in the state where drought took its toll, Simone says Virginia generally fared much better than many surrounding states or in the Midwest where pumpkins are in short supply. Virginia has approximately 3,000 acres total of pumpkins, gourds, squash, and other Halloween-related items. The presidential turkey that is set to be pardoned on Thanksgiving Day hails from a Virginia flock. That's coming up on Ag Insights. Since 1989, a turkey has been formally pardoned by the president prior to Thanksgiving in a national ceremony at the White House. This year's turkey is probably going to come from Rockingham County. Joining me today are Steve Willardson, president of Cargill Value Added Meats, and Hobie Bowen, president of the Virginia Poultry Federation. Gentlemen, welcome to Virginia Farming. Thank you. And Thank Ag you. Insights. Thank you. So let's get down to this. How were these birds chosen? out of the entire nation. How did, how did these birds from Virginia come to be chosen? How do we get to Virginia? How did we get yeah, to Virginia? Yeah, okay, well, we're, first we're glad to be here. As, uh, I'm chairman of the National Turkey Federation, and by tradition, the chairman gets to pick which state he'd like the birds to be grown in. And this year I chose Virginia. And uh, so on July 13th, we hatched 40 turkeys here in Harrisonburg. And out of that 40, we're gonna select some turkeys to go to Washington. Okay, so before you select from those turkeys, you have two that are spokes turkeys, I guess you would call them. Yes. That have been touring around for people to see. Um, how, how does that work? W what have you done with these turkeys since it was decided from this flock? How did, number one, how did you pick out the, the two that you were gonna take with you? Okay, we still haven't done that. It's still kind of a beauty contest. So okay. out of these, there's 40 turkeys that were placed. And those turkeys, as we go along, will we'll grow. And those uh, that, uh, as we get close to the time to go to Washington, two will be selected for that trip. Okay. Now, the two that you have that are traveling around now are really just spokes turkeys. They are actually will they will not be selected for the pardon. Is that's, that correct? That's correct. They will not. So they'll go around and visit the schools and so forth. And those they won't come back to the flock for biosecurity or disease reasons that we're concerned about. But they'll, uh, there will be two selected out of the remainder that will go to Washington. Okay, and so you said it's a beauty pageant for these, for the remainder of these turkeys. Yes. Well, what are you judging? Yeah, <clears throat> it's growth rate, it's the way the bird finishes, but it's also temperament and what we call personality. Birds have personalities, they're not all the same. Some react differently around people and obviously we want the one that's happy to be at the Rose Garden. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. and one that's not gonna try to nip at the president's hand, right? <laughs> that's correct, <laughs> when, he, yeah. when he tries to give him that pardon. Um, do we have names for these birds yet? We don't, and that's a fun thing. So the 30 elementary schools in Rockingham County have been asked to select two names, two from each school. Those names will be presented to the president in the White House, and they will make the decision on the names for the two turkeys. So the kids actually kind of get a part, play a part in it. That's right. That's and great. we're hoping we're going to be able to recognize a school or schools where the names come from. Well, sure, and that's yeah. bringing more ag into the classroom, isn't it? Yes. Which is. Uh, always a good thing. Um, these birds have been on display in a lot of places already. Tell me a little bit about where you've been with them and what they've done. Yeah, and Hobie, maybe this is a better one for you well, to answer. Well, really, the, the only place that we've had them has been the Rockingham County Fair so far. Okay. And then tomorrow they will be going to over to Doswell to the State Fair of Virginia and then they're going to be visiting some classrooms later on in this month. So that's kind of the extent of the travel so far. Okay, now who takes these, these turkeys out when they go? Yeah, we have, it's, it's, it's our employees. Okay. And they have fun with it, they really do. So they get, to, they get a, we have a specially made trailer and these birds get to travel in and go visit. And so it's our employees that take them out. So it's not a limo? It's not a limo. Almost though, right? Al almost. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty plush. <laughs> now when you take them into the schools, um, do they give a presentation on, on turkeys and, and help the kids learn from them while they're there? Sure, they will be doing that for sure. Uh, talk about some of the, tra the tradition of the national Thanksgiving turkey, talk about the importance of the turkey industry to the economy of the valley and to the farming community. 
in Virginia's role in turkey production. We have a rich history of turkey production here in the Shenandoah Valley. Sure, and uh, we were talking about a little earlier that you know, it was once the, the poultry capital of the world. Well, we still kind of consider Rockingham County the turkey capital. Actually, currently Rockingham is the third largest turkey producing county in the country, and Virginia ranks uh, fifth nationally in turkey production. Okay. So, when this bird is selected and it comes from Rockingham County, Virginia, what does that do for our Virginia Poultry Federation? What kind of boost is that for well, us? Well, it's just very exciting for our entire poultry industry uh, and gives us a chance to highlight the importance of the poultry industry in Virginia. We employ uh, more than 10,000 people in the Commonwealth, support the livelihoods of more than 1,100 farm families here and then uh, hundreds of jobs outside of the industry that provide products and services to poultry processors and farmers. So the industry really has a very large economic impact uh, statewide and, and really probably mostly right here in the Harrisonburg Central Shenandoah Valley area. Okay. Yeah, it's, a, it's a definitely a big industry around here and yeah. I think we're lucky to have uh, so many large employers in this yeah, area right, yeah. in, in that in that region. Um, Steve, tell me what's going to happen at this ceremony. Who all is going to it and what, what are you expecting to happen? Yeah, well, we're excited, I can tell you that. So, so part of my family is I spent my life in the turkey business more than 40 years. And so this is kind of a, a highlight for my family, but certainly for a number of our employees that will be going in, certainly the grower that's growing these and his family will be going into Washington. And who is our grower? Well, uh, we can't tell you that yet. Oh, oh it's a surprise. Yeah, it's okay. a surprise. Well, see, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the reason it's a surprise is for biosecurity and security for the for the turkeys. Oh, but sure. But we soon okay. will. We'll, we'll soon be announcing, and we're going to have a send-off party that we're excited about, and so we'll be sure and let you know soon. Well, you will, because I'll is. have to let our viewers know what who the farmer is that raised these raised these magnificent turkeys. That's right. Yeah. So now you're taking your kids, right? That's correct. And are they excited to go to the and, White House? And grandkids. So I'm going to get to take five of my grandkids that are really excited to go to the White House. Oh wow. So That's excited. amazing. It is. That'll be fun. It is. It's it's such a rich tradition, Amy. It's you know, you think of Virginia again. Many believe the first Thanksgiving was held here in Jamestown, Virginia. Right. Many believe the commercial turkey industry of today started in Virginia in 1920. It's an amazing history. It's an amazing history, and then you get to this crazy ceremony that was started back with, gosh, I think I read in 1947 was the first turkey that was presented to a president from the Federation. From the National Turkey Federation. Right. Uh, but it goes back, um, you know, back into the 1800s, back to the time of Abraham Lincoln when uh, turkeys have been presented to the president at Thanksgiving time. Uh, but the tradition of, of pardoning the turkey, I believe, started with, as you said, with uh, President George H.W. Bush in 1989, um, a right. formal pardon, even though uh, back uh, to the Kennedy administration, they, they've generally been uh, unofficially pardoned and have gone to uh, live out the remaining uh, years of their their life uh, on a local farm. Okay, and that was my next question. Where do these now? There's two that are go that are going, and I guess you're going to pick the one that has the best attitude that day to present to the president. You've got it on that morning, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so now, after this turkey is pardoned and the ceremony is over, where do these two turkeys go? Well, those turkeys will now go to Mount Vernon, where they'll live out the rest okay. of their natural life. Now, do they have a petting zoo? There yeah, petting and viewing of different animals there, and uh, okay. yeah, so although I haven't been there yet, I understand it's a very nice setting. It's beautiful. I have been yeah. there, and it's, yeah. it's a beautiful setting. I just, I didn't, I guess I didn't see the turkeys when we were there. Maybe they hadn't started it at that time. Yeah. So. N not certain. We've been there for the last three years, I think, at Mount Vernon. Mm -hmm. right? I'm not sure exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, that's great, gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here, and I look forward to hearing from you about which farmer. Um, is raising these turkeys because we'll definitely let our viewers know so we can show some of our Virginia pride. That's great. With them too. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> thank, sure thank you. Yeah, yeah. Sure thing. It. We'll be right back. Gourds are abundant this time of year and they make nice decorations. With tips on drying gourds, here's Mark Viette. 
Wouldn't you like to have a dried gourd like this that normally weighs 35 pounds, uh, very heavy? You can have this right in your home and use them from year to year. And really all you need to do is take certain types of gourds, especially within the group that is known as the bottle gourd family, Lagenaria. This is known as the speckled swan and it looks just like a swan. Well, it's very heavy, but you can dry it. To dry gourds, you really need about um, anywhere from 55 to 65 degree temperatures, not too warm because if they get too warm, they'll start to mold on the outer skin. Put them in a cool basement, a cool garage that won't uh, get too cold, and six months to a year later, you can have one of these gourds just like this. You might ask yourself, where am I going to find these gourds? Well, you can buy them. I've even seen them now at craft shops. Or you can grow them yourself, or you can just go to your garden store late in the season and buy some of these bottle gourds. And once they're dried, there's lots of things that you can do with them. This is a great kids project for school, family project, or just, you know, you can do it yourself in the evening or on weekends. And you want to clean them with a scouring pad. You can use sandpaper to get more of the discoloration off. But it's got a really attractive pattern the way it is. And then once that's done, you know, you can either uh, stain them, you can use a little bit of stain, or you can just coat them with a polyurethane finish. Either way, um, you can use them. But beyond that, you have other things that you can do. You can make birdhouses. When you're creating your own birdhouses, you can use anywhere from a one and one half inch drill bit or even a one and one quarter inch wood bit. Really depends on the type of birds that you want to attract because they, the, the size really determines the type of bird. I sometimes like to use one and a quarter inch sizes because it keeps out some of the bigger birds like starlings and one and a quarter inches is great for bluebirds. The other thing that you need to do is drill holes in the bottom, but what you can do is drill more holes throughout this gourd or larger holes that you can use something like this for and create a bird feeder out of it. So you can fill it with bird seed and your birds will go in it and feed on the seed and you just hang this just like this from a tree. One of my favorites is this one here. And uh, this is not one I did myself, but it's been hand painted and it's a great birdhouse with the seeds and everything else. So you can even do something as elaborate like this, or you can even take one of the flat bottle gourds and you can create your own piggy bank. So, you know, this is great with the leather ears and the cork for the snout and um, even use a stem for the tail and you are set to go. It's just that easy. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. Taking a look at our ag calendar, on November 5th, a workshop will be offered in Blackstone called Preparing for a Gap Food Safety Audit. The course will discuss the requirements of the Good Agricultural Practices Certification, and students will learn hands-on techniques for how to effectively carry out the certification process. There is a $75 fee and space is limited. For more information, contact Eric Bowen. On November 8th, a similar class will be offered in Scottsville. The Food Safety and GAP Certification Training Workshop is from 8 to 4 at Maple Hill Farm. A mock audit will help illustrate strategies that can be put in place to ensure that your farm is following good agricultural practices. There is a $30 fee and space is limited. For more information, visit localfoodhub.org. Well, that does it for our show this week. Have a great week, everyone. I'm Amy Rocher for Virginia Farming.
This program's brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. From apples to zucchini, Virginia farmers work hard to put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Polaris, featuring its hardest working, smoothest riding off-road vehicle, the multi-passenger Room for Six Ranger Crew, and the two-seated Ranger 500. Hunt, farm, or trail, Polaris has a vehicle for them all at Polaris.com. <laughs> 